Good. Long way away. Uh, Dr. Katerina uh, Standish from Otago University in the South Island of New Zealand in beautiful Dunedin. And uh, she's going to talk today about what yes. a reciprocal peace process looks like. And uh, Dr. Standish is a lecturer at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Otago. And her publications include uh, papers in, on cultural violence and gender, cultural violence and education, and her other research interests are uh, peace curriculum and narratives. So, welcome, Dr. Sandwich. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, the jet lag is hitting me a little bit here and there, so if I start to slur, let me know. <laughs> um, so, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how my topic today bridges with the other speakers. And, uh, I guess part that makes sense to me is the idea that you you don't have to be a particular kind of person to be involved in change. And, and I hope that by the end of this very uh, short presentation, you, you have a sense of the connectivity uh, that we often think is somebody else's job, someone else's to-do list. So um, I'll just start. And I, I did bring my watch, I left it on the bedside table, and my phone's dead, so I'm going to rely on Robert to let me know when to stop talking. So, um, uh, in peace and conflict studies, we talk a lot about you know, the idea of transformation of conflict, and the cessation of conflict, uh, conflict resolution, these ideas that conflict is something that um, we need to stop. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about, this is really a think piece paper, it's not an empirical study that I did. Um, and I, I guess I'll just stop talking and start letting you know what I'm talking about. So when we commonly think about a peace process, these are definitions that have come to mind. You know, the idea that there's a sort of gradual step that we're involved with. It's, it's the beginning, a middle, and an end, and at the end you have peace. It's like some kind of a gradual process. Um, and that when we look at peace processes, we normally think of peace processes quite top tier, something that governments do, or at least people that are very, very important. Okay, so what's conflict? And I think that this is just from my perspective. I always talk to my students about this. Conflict is the only reason anything changes. Conflict can be creative uh, and very productive. But from my perspective and from the perspective of people in our field, violent conflict is not productive. And so we, we want to at, at all times go into a nonviolent um, uh, mechanism of, of transforming conflict from what it is. So we don't want violent conflict, but we do recognize that conflict itself is not something that's necessarily bad. So what's reciprocity? And this is kind of where I was reading a lot of social psychology, and it really uh, made me think about what are our basic sort of instincts as human beings. So reciprocity is defined as an, a reciprocal exchange of benefits. Okay, um, and the idea is that uh, it removes obstacles towards engaging with one another. And the definition here was just an you know, exchange of benefits between parties that can remove obstacles and encourages cooperation in the future. So. What is violence, right? Violence is acts of aggression or threats of aggression. So why is that important? So um, from, from our perspective in our field, we talk about violence, and we don't talk about just direct violence. We talk about structural violence. We talk about cultural violence. We talk about violence as an incarnation of harm or the threat of harm, and it's based on all kinds of different parameters of humanity um, and resources and identity and things like that. So when we conceive of violence, and we're of course conceiving of conflict, we need to remember that it's violent conflict we're trying to start. So from that perspective, violence is what we're trying to stop. And there's many different incarnations of what violence uh, can be. So this is sort of very simplistic. This is sort of me you know, teaching my four-year-old about what I do. Why is violence important? Because it can lead to negative relationships. It can lead to an ongoing feeling of discord with one another. Violence does not produce uh, feelings of equanimity and well-being. It tends to produce the opposite. So it leads to negative relationships. That's why it's important. So this is very easy. This is reciprocity logic. And uh, basically the idea that there's more than one kind of reciprocity. And the, the paper, I, I was told to print out 30 copies when I was in NZ. 
and I did so. So if anybody's interested, I'm sorry the print is like six point, but help yourself. There's a number of different definitions of reciprocity in the paper, but for our purposes, we just need to really think about two. Positive reciprocity is cooperative in kind, and negative reciprocity is punitive or vengeful. So why is reciprocity important when we talk about conflict? Basically because conflict between people or groups can be conceived of as lack of or breakdown in relationship. So when we talk about positive reciprocity, we're talking about a positive relationship. And when we talk about negative reciprocity, we're talking about a relationship that's built on some form of reciprocal negative response, not benefit. Am I going too fast? Okay. Right, so my paper was an analysis of different peace processes, so I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later, about a particular kind of reciprocity called symbolic reciprocity. So I'll talk a little bit about that here. So symbolic reciprocity is not the value, uh, what's called the instrumental value of a benefit, but the act of giving itself. And you know the old you know, sort of I guess the, uh, the comment of the maxim that it's the thought that counts. Symbolic reciprocity is referring to this. It's the social psychological construct that I've sort of thrown into piece of common sense. Symbolic reciprocity carries with it a significance over and above the actual value of the benefit that is exchanged. So it adheres to important cultural trains of understanding. The act of giving being more important than the item or amount that's given. Okay? And again, talking about symbolic reciprocity, this is a benefit, in a way, that comes out of this idea of uh, reciprocity. So when I did the analysis in this brief paper, um, and it's available online from the Studies Journal just recently, I looked at Diamond McDonald's book, Multi-Track Diplomacy. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. It's about almost 10 years old, maybe not that old. But in multi-track diplomacy, Diamond and McDonald look at nine different tracks of diplomacy. So diplomacy isn't something that's only done by government. From their analysis, diplomacy exists uh, and, is, and is possible to, it's possible to participate in diplomacy from a variety of different levels. Uh, just briefly, track one, governments. Track two, professionals or NGOs. Uh, we would be considered track two in this room, probably. Track three, business, commerce. Track four, private citizens. Track five, education or training. Some of us who are still in education, definitely. Part six, activism. Many of us are involved in activism in this room. Track seven, religion. Uh, track eight, funding. And track nine, media and communications. So Diamond and McDonald look at diplomacy from a multi-perspective rather than looking at it as something only that governments or government agents do on behalf of their governments and in terms of their government's foreign policy. But this is where I diverge from their uh, pers uh, projector, uh, sorry, trajectory. So Diamond and McDonald see diplomacy as a way of forming relationships <coughs> with people in order to gain an outcome. And the outcome is generally a peace process, some outcome of a peace process. So diplomacy is a, is a process that uses relationships to obtain results. And here we go, a typical diplomatic peace process, the goal of a peace process is an agreement, a ceasefire, a treaty, uh, some kind of an outcome that is, uh, in, in, one, in one way or another, considered a cessation point, an end of the peace process. So that's what they're going for. In a reciprocal peace process, the goal is not the outcome, the goal is the relationship. In a reciprocal peace process, Relationships are not used to make ceasefires. Relationships are the goal. So, we talk about a reciprocal peace process, but the goal, the best kind of them, in, in, well, embody the, um, the components of what's called a, a symbolic form of reciprocity. Now, there's three things that are required for a reciprocal benefit to be considered symbolic. It has to be voluntary. It isn't something that has to happen, it's something that is voluntary. It's an act of will from the individuals who are uh, involved. It has to be long term. It can't be a one off, it can't be one situation. And the other part of it is that the return of benefits has to be uncertain. 
you can't know for a fact that if you give this, they give that, right? So in order to achieve this level of symbolic reciprocity, the benefits have to be voluntarily given, they have to be given over a long period of time, and the idea of return has to be uncertain. So it's the giving with the open hand idea. So what I did in this paper, and, and if you're interested, there's a lot of information about each individual peace process that I uh, did an analysis on, uh, this is sort of the synopsis. This is what the Quant scholars do, is they put a table on the board and they talk for a long, long time about the table. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But the reality is, is that I looked at different track peace processes and I analyzed them for symbolic reciprocal benefit. And what I came to, and you can see here, uh, I don't know if that has a laser pointer on it, but uh, the Dayton Accords, we talked about those this morning, that would be a track, track one. The TRCs in South Africa, that was a track two. Um, Rwanda baskets in the, in the um, Commerce and Funding, sorry, the Commerce Department for Business and Commerce. Uh, Rwanda baskets, and you can read about them more in the paper. And that's one of those sort of local peace building uh, initiatives. And the goal there is to create economic infrastructure both at the location where they're created and the place where they're sold. Um, at the Suhan Peace Project, which I talk a little bit more about in a moment. Uh, the Peace Building and Development Institute in Sri Lanka, which is an educative institute that trains peacekeepers and peace builders on the, on the ground. Um, and then the Ulster Project in Northern Ireland, which does exchanges with youth from Northern Ireland to homes in the United States. It's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, and the idea is, is that people that people that engage with encounter uh, don't become paramilitary actors themselves. I mean, it's, most, it's both boys and girls that uh, are involved in that. Uh, the Interfaith Peace Project is exactly that. It's an interfaith peace project where people learn about each other with the goal of, of uh, contributing to peace. The United Nations Peace Building Fund, well, that's a global organization that gives funds for local peace building initiatives. And uh, Media for Peace is in the Paul Free Radio. Uh, and their goal was to sort of take part the um, institutional rhetoric of the peace process in Nepal so that people could talk openly. And it was broadcast in several different languages. So there's more information on those organizations in the paper. But just so you can see from my uh, incredibly scholarly check marks, <laughs> the only one of these peace processes that achieves symbolic reciprocity is a project called the Sulha Peace Project. Those of you familiar called with what? I'm sorry. Sulha, S U L H A, Sulha. Those of you familiar with Arabic, uh, Sulha is basically um, a word that is a, reflects customary and traditional ways of making peace within the Palestinian society. Um, and the people that created this project, there's a little bit more information on, in the paper, uh, they are the only people, according to my analysis, who are doing what I consider to be a reciprocal peace process that achieves symbolic benefit. So what's a reciprocal peace process? It's a set of interactions that result in a long-term, deliberate, contact that leads to a positive relationship. We haven't done a lot about talking about negative and positive peace today, but when we were talking about violence earlier on, you know, we know that negative peace is just the cessation of violent conflict. We know that negative peace is simply the absence of something, the absence of overt violence or, or overt military or overt weaponry, etc. But we know that positive peace is not just the absence of violence, but the presence of other forms of equanimous living, sustainability, harmonious relationships, etc. So reciprocal peace processes are, they're one of their objectives is this outcome of positive peace, so positive peace. So the Sulha Peace Project is a citizen-based encounter group bringing Israelis and Palestinians together in Israel and the West Bank to talk, to pray, to eat, to cook, to sing, to dance, at a really big bonfire and just experience one another's humanity. Sulha Priest process takes place once a month in either Israel or the West Bank. Whether you can get there or not makes it uncertain. They've been doing it for years, almost a decade now. That makes it long term. And they are providing avenues of understanding the so-called other, in air quotes, uh, instead of allowing other people to manage the discourse of who their so-called enemy is. So for my analysis, this was the only peace project that I could find that not only met the requirements of a reciprocal peace process, but also had symbolic benefit as well. 
So what? That's what, that's what my students always say to me. So what? So what? So, okay. If peace processes try and harness the power of symbolic reciprocity, they don't only contribute to the present circumstances, but they inhibit future incarnations, right? So adding a reciprocal peace practice to any peace processes that is, are currently happening becomes important peace practice. So my thesis in this work is the idea that if you add reciprocal peace process to any other peace process that's evolved, you're not trying to get an outcome, you're trying to build a relationship. And a relationship, based on our, our human qualities, thank you, uh, that is positive and long term, uses what's called tit for tat or game theory logic. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You're mean to me, I'm mean to you. That's negative reciprocity. You're nice to me, I'm nice to you. That's positive reciprocity. Reciprocal peace processes, they add some sugar to the lemonade, right? So how do we do this? This is the next part that um, my students ask me about. How do we do this? Okay, after conflict. I don't conceive of peace building in general as something that's only post-conflict. I think it can be used preventatively. I think it can be used during conflict post-conflict and in what are so-called tranquil nations. To my mind, peace building is something that happens along that wide temporal line. And this is one of those uh, useful tools that I think we can use post-conflict, but it can be used at any other time as well to prevent conflict. So after conflict, the goal is, uh, the goal in broken or damaged relationship, this is Jean-Paul Lederach here, is to stimulate positive encounters. There's no relationship, uh, if there's no relationship, you can easily create one through reciprocal benefits. So how do we do this? And then we can start here and go back. So how to conduct a reciprocal peace process? You start from anywhere among Diamond and McDonald's nine tracks of diplomacy. Give something to anyone along those nine tracks of diplomacy without expecting anything in return. But what do you give? Guarantee of weapons? Prisoners. Prisoners? Compliment. Compliment. Thank you. That's, I'm with you on that one, Rose. OK, what do you give? Something positive. Something beneficial. Something non-harming. That's the other part of it. A gift, a token, appreciation, your attention. Pay attention. Let people know that, that you know that they're there. This is a reciprocal benefit. As long as you engage with people, who here has just gotten a, a anonymous email from somebody saying, good job, it feels fantastic. It makes you want to do better. This is what we're built to do as humans. This is my opinion, this is idealistic, but I'm sorry, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> if we change our actions now and in the future, we can change the past. I study conflict narratives. I study people's excuses for negative reciprocity, excuses for why I have a right to hurt you. And from my, from my perspective, looking at reciprocal benefit, being a part of the solution, as they say, I think it's a good way to go. Thank you.